first discovered that they could determine something and almost irresistibly continue in this determination until they attained their goal or destroyed themselves in the attempt. In early times, men thought of the will as a special faculty or power. Some held that it was derived from deity. Others that it represented the power of evil in man. It seemed that in the human will rested the power of disobedience. The person could will against the common good. He could shake his fist like the fabled Persian emperor against heaven. And he could relentlessly pursue his own objectives, regardless of consequences or cost to those around him. The power of the will frightened most members of primitive society. And they attempted to discipline it, control it, work with it as though it was actually an independent organ of power. Human Spinoza, however, were closer to the fact for well, they realized that the will represents merely the pressure of what we might term the subjective personality. The individual willing, so to say, is always more or less the expression of his immediate conviction or his immediate interpretation the kind of circumstance which he wishes to bring about. Will, then, is an intense form of wishing. It is a wish supported by the resources of the mind, and in exploring the nature of will function, we are impressed with the fact that it usually represents a faculty of selection or of choice. Will usually means that the individual selects from several possible courses of action. One, which he relentlessly pursues. Thus in will itself, there is a certain selectivity, or appears to be. Perhaps we would be more correct if we pointed out that this selectivity is nothing but the expression, the dominant expression experience patterns in that person. The will must therefore always proceed from the degree of integration which the person possesses. In the majority of individuals, will is not strong because certainties are not strong within that person. Will to operate must be comparatively unclouded. It must have very little sense of division within its own nature. It must not reflect upon alternate courses of conduct, nor must it weigh carefully several probabilities. The moment the individual divides his attention or suspects that the contrary to his present course would be a better course, the will is vitated. The individual is no longer sure of himself. Therefore, the power of will has to depend to a certain degree upon the power of egoism. The individual must think of himself as a being capable of willing. He must also, to some degree, assume that whatever his own will determines must be important, at least for him. He cannot will intensely if his objectives are unimportant or insignificant to himself. Nor can he sustain will with a good spirit unless he is confident 
that his own course has some peculiar merit or advantage. Will can very often be an intensely selfish instrument. The will most commonly presses upon the individual the urgency of doing that which he most desires to do. Thus we must recognize that will has a relationship to desire, that it has to do with the fulfillment of some subjective intensity of purpose. The individual is willing to fulfill some pressure within his own nature. As one individual expressed it, will is the intense determination of the person to do exactly what he intended to do. This is not far from the fact, because without this intensity of intention, we would not find the operation of the will nearly as effective. In working with the human being, we are also inclined to notice that intensive willfulness is often associated with adolescence. The mature person is less likely to be willful than the immature person. The reason being that the mature person, confronted with a wide area of experiences, is less certain of his own intention. The longer we live, the less certain we are of most things. The more experienced we are, the less confident we are in our own judgment in all matters. And as we proceed along the course of intelligence, we begin to recognize that there are many different contributing factors which we do not fully understand. A person who has only one idea is therefore most likely to be highly willful in the matter of that idea. If, however, he has a wide area of interest, his intensity will be decreased. Most strong-willed persons in history have been individuals comparatively uninformed. They have been certain because they did not know. Certainty is easiest where man's experience of life is least adequate. Certainty is most certain where ignorance prevents us from considering opposite possibilities. The person who has great, intense, enduring uh, self-opinion, who is consistently certain that he knows and is right, will very often become extremely willful. And in these instances, obstacles are entirely misunderstood. Instead of the obstacle causing the individual to question himself, it causes him to cast himself against the obstacle, always determined to break through. Thus, the individual frequently breaks through patterns of law and order, and crime is... is uh, greater among persons who are very intense in their will procedures. We like to think of some people as strong-willed and others as weak-willed, but we have no evidence that the factor of will itself is either strong or weak. We are more inclined to assume that the so-called strong-willed person is simply one whose intensity sustains the pressure of his own will procedure. That it is not that the will is stronger, but that the individual is more intense in his own desires. Thus, we cannot say that strong-willed people are good or weak-willed people are bad. In our way of life and under the existing conditions under which we function, it is assumed that strong-willed people will be more successful, that weak-willed persons, lacking intensity, dedication, and continuity, will be less successful. Thus, in the struggle for success, strength of will is regarded as a valuable instrument. It causes the individual to be more ruthless than he would otherwise be, 
It makes him less considerate of possible damage as he proceeds and causes him to think of the fulfillment of his own purpose as his one and only objective. Thus there is something very selfish often about the will procedure. It does not arise usually from a matured consideration of values. It arises from an intense desire to fulfill some personal end or objective. Now, will as a phenomenon is an interesting thing because of the complexities with which it is immediately beset. There is much to indicate that nature does not particularly uh, reward the strong-willed person. Rather, the stronger the will, the more powerful the obstacles which the individual ultimately faces. Great will intensity causes the person to create a number of obstacles for himself and for other persons. Let us imagine uh, the simple situation, which, by the way, is almost completely true. We don't have to do very much uh, fantasy thinking in connection with it. We have somewhere in the neighborhood of three billion persons in this world. This does not account for non-human beings that also have wills, because we know that many animals are exceedingly stubborn, many insects exceedingly tenacious. The instinct of continuity is present outside of the human kingdom. But we will assume for a moment that we have three billion human beings, each one of which is moving to the fulfillment of the desires of his own willing. In other words, each person is trying to advance his own cause. He is trying to achieve that which he wishes to achieve. And he is pressing harder and harder toward this end until the wish becomes the will. In the process of attempting this, he must inevitably, finally, lock with the collective wills of other persons. Each individual is one out of three billion. Against him, all other wills are united. Not because they are opposed to him, but because each is intensely concerned with the fulfillment of itself. You get enough of these willful people, each one working to achieve his own purpose, and the result is universal chaos. Every person's will interferes with the function of every other person's will. All straight lines are lost. As we proceed, for example, in business, we have a will to reach the top. Uh, unfortunately, there are a dozen others with the same determination to reach the top. Each of these individuals, therefore, becomes highly competitive with the others. Some who are less ethical may use every possible subterfuge to outdistance and outwit their competitors. Each one in his own way is resolved to attain the end he desires. And in the confusion of this, the average person's will is hopelessly enmeshed in the common will pressure of his time. There is no evidence whatever that this impulse of the will arises from any peculiar, particular, or separate level of mentation. There is no identity or uniformity in will patterns. There is a certain common method by which will operates but its objectives differ with each individual. The objectives are also further qualified by various attainments or lack of attainments uh, dist which distinguish the individual who is willing. Thus we must assume that will is individual, rising from the individuality of the person, that therefore it is, it is an expression of his own intensities 
in the furtherance of that which he is, and the gradual motion of that which he is toward that which he wills to be. Over the power of the will, therefore, there has to be some regulating factor. We cannot all do exactly as we will to do. Two or three willful children in a family, and the family is seriously disrupted. All will has to be in some way civilized and socialized. It has to be made suitable for a being living in what we term a socialized system, a society, one in which each person is to a measure dependent upon others and also must to a degree sacrifice his own ends for the advancement of some larger collective purpose. And one of the most difficult things for a will to do is to sacrifice any part of its own purpose. Therefore, even under a so-called civilized system, willfulness is still one of the prevailing phenomena and also usually one of the most distressing. For in this case of will intensity, the person cheerfully uh, attempts to defraud others of their rightful will participation in some project or activity. If we go back now to our concept of the machine of the sensory perception, we must finally come to the conclusion that the personality being composed of the sum of its own parts, and these parts variously developed and variously unfolded, working together to form a kind of compound, the personality syndrome. The personality syndrome is ourselves at any given moment. It is the result of exactly what we know and exactly what we do not know. It is not only the results, a result of this general knowing, it is the result of our particular knowing in various areas of activity. Theoretically, this syndrome can only be the sum of the various attainments of the sensory perceptions plus the mental coordinating factor. Brought together by the mental coordinating factor, uh, these elements which constitute the personality syndrome make a final chemical compound. This is a psychochemical compound. It is a compound of attributes, qualities, a compound of abilities and debilities, of likes and dislikes, of refinements and lack of refinements. It represents in its compound all of the mysterious, unequal development which makes the individual the strange being that he is. If, for example, we could see uh, the diagrammatic structure of human beings, we might be considerably astonished. What appears to be a well-organized person, rather tastily attired in a well-fitting draped coat, might be, when considered from the pure standpoint of his inner integration, a rather deformed, lopsided, and asymmetrical creature. We would discover that the various elements of his personality are not harmoniously adjusted. We would also realize that his knowledge is to use an expression used by Hindus in referring to music, full of holes. That there are strong points where he makes a fair showing and weak points where he makes a miserable showing. Also, that in the various possible patterns into which the personality can develop, the individual may have a de definitely unbalanced arrangement of his own personality factors. In most cases, in the development of the average person, the personality represents the intensive uh, progression of a small group of dominant faculties. 
uh, the subdominants have very little opportunity. Therefore, in any one embodiment, the individual, having selected a dominant, proceeds to more or less take this as a horse takes a bit between its teeth and start to race with this dominant. This dominant seems to offer a number of advantages. First, it offers an economic advantage. If the dominant has been fairly well developed, the individual has a particular skill. This particular skill, whether it is in profession or trade, therefore signifies an achievement in which one part of the nature is much more adequately unfolded, developed, or informed than some other part of the nature. Actually, however, in coming down through a long period of time, the individual has been working with many aspects of his own personality. The part which is not being used <coughs> dominantly at the, t at the time in some profession or trade is not dead. It represents a subdominant, and this subdominant very often becomes the basis of psychic disorder. The subdominant being immediately neglected, having no opportunity to express itself normally, becomes neurotic. Now, it is uh, interesting to consider that a personality, one individual, may have a half a dozen independent, neurotic, subdominant factors in him. We think of the neurotic as just being a compound in which the entire person is frustrated. Actually, this is not usually the case, even in a good, solid example of neurosis. Uh, nearly always... The individual has, however, too large an area of non-expressed factors that do not come into normal usage in daily living. The uh, individual, therefore, has a syndrome that is made up of a family of independent elements. In this family, one or two children have been spoiled. A couple of cantankerous old relatives are constantly interfering. The husband and wife are not entirely compatible. One or two children are neglected. And in all, the family is in poor organization. This poor organization gradually results in, a, in various types of psychic pressure developing in the individuals according to their relation to the general family situation. The same occurs within the personality. The individual who has developed himself very well, for example, along lines of banking or medicine or law, finds that he has a profession or a business which is reasonably suitable to support him. Because today, as never before, all forms of business are intensely competitive, it becomes important to this man to continue to advance his knowledge of the particular subject upon which he depends for livelihood. So what happens? The man, for instance, becomes a salesman. Uh, first thing you know, he has to attend sales meetings. He is not just a salesman from 9 to 4.30 or 5. That was more or less what he started out to be. But he finds a little later that he has to be a salesman two, three evenings a week, learning more about sales technique. He then discovers that someone is liable to outstrip him completely. Therefore, perhaps he has to go back to school and take a course in salesmanship or a refresher, just as the doctor attends frequent conferences and uh, symposia and things of that nature to keep up with the details of his own profession. Little by little, his job takes over his life. By the time he gets through, the dominant factors have completely eclipsed or vampirized all the lesser areas within his nature. And because nature itself is not interested in whether he's a successful banker or not, having no concern over such matters, Nature does not support and abet 
this intense specialization. Man rewards it and nature punishes it. And the individual has to decide who he's going to be with. Now, most persons have decided that they would rather take a chance and then uh, break faith with nature, whose processes are wonderful and mysterious and not very obvious, rather than to take a chance and break with tradition and with present prevailing policy and immediately endanger themselves uh, as to loss and demotion or failure for advancement. So the average person in making his decisions has a tendency to sacrifice what he does not understand in favor of that which is immediately useful in some way. He therefore sacrifices the greater for the nearer. He sacrifices what might be termed by him an idealism for an immediate realism. Nature has very little patience with this procedure, however. Nature is interested in the person becoming an adequate human being. Now, as a result of developing very intensely certain aspects of the personality, the individual gradually draws into these selected aspects the greater part of the sustaining power, force, or energy of life. In other words, he supports these dominants with the greatest amount of the available libido. He gets behind these faculties, these processes which are making him rich and sick, and gives them everything he's got. As he proceeds to do this, he finds he also has to withdraw energy from other areas. He may have to withdraw so much energy that after what might be considered a reasonably busy day, he may come home, collapse, and go to sleep, and have no further interest in life until the next day. He is simply tired out. He has no longer the energy to develop the various aspects of his nature. Now, this might not be quite so tragic if it was not true that in this procedure he is cheating this thing which we call the mental coordinator. The mental coordinator is now confronted with a situation in which, like a highly specialized uh, machine, the human brain, the mechanical brain, so to say, uh, that this machine is no longer fed authentic data. Uh, you expect the IBM machine to produce certain answers, but it cannot produce these answers if the necessary data is not fed into the machine. And when you get an individual who is hobbling along through life on one great specialty and a broken crutch for the rest of his life, he is not able to supply the coordinator with the information necessary to produce a reasonable judgment. All of the elements of perception and reflection which should contribute to judgment have been outwitted, except one or two. Throughout being outwitted and neglected, vast areas of human consciousness are underprivileged, undernourished, and lack any sustaining uh, will or libido to energize them. These other areas, these neglected areas, proceed to bring in inadequate testimony. The individual has no interest, no appreciation in various qualities which are important. When he selects a friend, he selects a man who talks his language. But because in his own nature he has never developed insight, he is unable to cope with the problem of his so-called friend's character. He has no power to read that character. He can only meet the friend on the level of such attainment as he possesses. If he is a physician and his friend is a physician, they meet on the level of medicine. But outside of this, they have no meeting at all. So that the individual simply has a friendship for those qualities which are like his own. He may therefore be bitterly deceived or disillusioned by characteristics which he has no ability to judge. 
Now, it is true that in the majority of instances, we do gain a certain general, uh, not very penetrating insight uh, on, in areas outside of dominant interests. But I think we can say definitely at the present time that so-called civilized man has one dominant, maybe two or three weak subdominants, uh, sub and that the rest of his compound nature is little better than a vacuum. There is nothing being contributed. Because of this unbalanced, unreasonable, disordered state of himself, the coordinator must come up with faulty conclusions, uh, must come up with false values, uh, must falsely estimate uh, the meaning of things. The individual looking out through his eyes upon a world, sees not what is there, but sees what he has been trained to see. The rest of this world is comparatively invisible. His eyes may record it, that is true, but what they record is meaningless, because he has never energized the areas of himself to, to understand these things. Thus, one man going out oh, and uh, standing on the side of a mountain overlooking a great scene will be deeply moved by the magnificence of the spectacle. Another man who has climbed to the same height and stands there puffing, without any appreciation of the scene whatever, turns to a friend and says, if I had been paid to do this, it would have cost $10,000. The person simply had no concern or no consideration uh, for those areas of value which are peculiar to the nature lover. Nature itself, however, doesn't like this. Nature doesn't like to see individuals uh, working from the beginning to the end of life without ever having the experience of a well-balanced attitude. So nature is continuously trying to break down this excessive specialization. One way it tries to break down specialization is its oldest and most uh, basic biological trick, and that is through marriage. It is one way in which nature attempts to prevent the individual uh, from losing contact with most of life. Through marriage and family and children, the individual is forced back into certain realities. He is forced back into the exhibition of his own abilities to cope with immediate circumstances. The atomic engineer suddenly finds himself the father of twins. This is a moment of great crisis. It means that either this man must draw upon his humanity resources within himself, must allow certain human and natural emotions to take over, must gradually divide his attention, or else he is going to be extremely unfair either to his profession or to his family. He must learn, therefore, to carry divided interests with dignity. Another way nature uh, works on this project is through the aging process. By this process, nature itself is constantly forcing the individual into different adjustments with living. The child has one group of adjustments. The adolescent has another. The mature person has still another. The aged still another. Nature is constantly trying to force us to diversify force us to take various areas of life and enrich them, take various levels of our own intensities to bring these levels into objectivity. If nature succeeds, a certain maturity is thrust upon us by circumstances. If, however, we are too set in our ways, too unchanging in our determination, and too self-centered, we will resent and reject all natural condition, and go headlong into some extraordinary intensity which will ultimately bring us uh, to disaster because the human nature is not equipped for this kind of monorail existence.
We have to diversify in order to live. In this process of diversifying, uh, we begin to break down the intensities of isolated autocratic powers within ourselves. If man has only one dominant interest in life and everything else is neglected, this individual has turned his career over to an autocrat an absolute tyrant, and a complete dictator. He has lost actually all uh, conscious control over his own conduct. Certainly he fulfills the common patterns which are required by society. But he is not developing a personality that is safe for himself or for those around him. If he is going in this direction too far, then his will becomes more and more one-pointed. And his will, focusing upon his principal activity and his principal interest, will and often does cause him to be completely ruthless and to be entirely willing to sacrifice his own health his own happiness, his own peace of mind, and the securities of those dependent upon him for the mere purpose of fulfilling his own dominant determination. Now, if all these determinations were wonderful and beautiful things, it would not be quite so bad, but this is not the way it is in life. Many of these determinations which we so vitalize with energy are not meritorious or commendable. Some of them are simply utter expressions of selfishness. They represent the individual living for the fulfillment of his own desires alone. And these desires usually themselves neither reasonable nor healthy. If the will uh, is available for the continual support of these intensities, the person can move from comparative insignificance to an exceedingly dangerous condition. And most of the world's tyrants, like Adolf Hitler or Napoleon or Genghis Khan or Caesar, were great self-willed vehicles of energy. They were determined to fulfill their own ambitions. And they have left the pages of history red with the blood of the innocent. This type of grand egoism, this egoistic self-will mania, is probably an exaggerated situation. And very few uh, persons in the normal experience of life feel that they are touched by any such extraordinary excess. But many in smaller ways have sacrificed the world in which they lived, sacrificed the immediate things which they should have considered simply to advance will purpose. Suppose we allow for a moment that the average person in functioning with various situations has built up this machine of the six senses to a degree that it has reasonably or fairly completely integrated the individual in relationship to his environment. We will say that this person, by use of the five senses and the reflective faculties working with the senses, has gradually individualized himself into a person who has derived most of his objectives and his instincts and his appetites from environmental pressures, but nevertheless has gradually integrated into a personality, this personality being the inevitable byproduct of the time, place, and conditions in which the individual lives. It's moved in upon himself very largely. That part of his own nature, which might be regarded as greater than the self, or deeper within his own experience than his experience of selfhood, is very seldom given much consideration. In fact, we are inclined to doubt its existence. Uh, unless we go much more deeply into these matters than the average, uh, even the average scientist of the present day. We are inclined to simply assume 
that the individual is the sum of his parts and that these parts have their own origin in environmental pressures by which certain stimuli are contributed to the central nervous system which organizes these stimuli into a point of view or an attitude or a way of life. And what we call a person is an attitude. It is a summation of pressures, of various traditional procedures, of the testimony of sensory perceptions, and the individual gradually gathering together and reflecting upon those peculiar experiences which are his because of the faculties with which he recorded them. So we have this person. This person has a fair knowledge of mathematics. If he's a recent college graduate, he doesn't know how to spell, but that uh, isn't considered too important because he really doesn't want to learn to spell. He expects to hire a secretary to do that within a year or two. He's going to have a little further trouble, however, when he discovers the secretary can't spell. <laughs> but this is something we'll come around to in due course. But the individual has a little of the three R's, not enough of them. He has a little smattering, maybe, of a language. He has some the minor specialization, which he hasn't carried too far. He likes music. He enjoys dancing. He can take a car apart and put it together again. He could do that before he went to school. He can recognize uh, the principal television programs. He uh, has uh, a smattering of taste, good, bad, or indifferent. He has heard a few names. In fact, he has gradually become a name dropper, which is one of the indications of higher education. But he has now reached the point where, out of the fragments and elements of his education, in which he has studied too long and learned too little, he has to form a personality. This personality is further influenced by his family condition, what kind of relatives he had, whether his parents were well suited to each other. Uh, all kinds of different phenomenal situations add together to form this thing we call a personality. But having put it together the best way he could, depending upon the coordinator to always bring a state of synthesis, even if there's not too much to synthesize, uh, the person now emerges as a person. He em emerges as this mysterious symbol of all that he is and all that he isn't. And he calls this mysterious symbol himself. This self he cannot really explore. He knows in a measure how it was put together. He will never probably know why it was put together. He recognizes that it is composed of separate elements, which in various ways can be partly separated, but never completely so. He realizes that if some part of this sensory or coordinating structure is disordered, that he is disoriented and may definitely lose his mental coordination. But here he is as a self. Whatever he has, whatever he is, all these together, good and bad, strong and weak, have made him into a person. And uh, there's one thing that he is inordinately proud of, and that is the fact that he is a person. Being a person means that he feels somewhere within himself a center of life. This center of life he dignifies with the term I. And he thinks that whenever he speaks for this center of life, he is speaking uh, with, in an oracular manner equal to that of the oracle of Delphi in Greece. Anything that comes out of this self is sacred. If it is not sacred in the theological sense, it is sacred in a psychological sense. This self, some way, is the last recourse. There's nothing beyond it. 
When an individual says, this I believe, he is making a statement of small worth but great importance. To have the feeling, to have the sense of selfness means to have uniqueness. The individual is unique because he has experienced the only self he can experience, and that is a unique experience. If he could experience a dozen other people's selves, he wouldn't be nearly so unique or so awe-stricken with the importance of his own nature. But he can never know any other self than his own. He can talk about other selves. He can observe other people with self. But he never can have the intimate and immediate experience of being anyone but himself. Thus to live in a very close association with a mystery for which we have no adequate explanation nearly always leads to a certain hero worship. The individual overestimates the importance of himself. He overestimates the integrity of his own nature and he overestimates the sphere of influence in which he has a right to occupy. And to him this self is a sovereignty. He has a perfect right under the sun to be lord of all he can get hold of. He has perfect right to push other selves aside, because other selves are not himself. And he in himself is the important thing. Many, many years ago, when I took over the Church of the People, around 1921, here in Los Angeles, I inherited it indirectly from its founder, Dr. Benjamin Fay Mills, who was a well-known evangelist. Dr. Mills used to get up in the pulpit quite frequently and make a statement of overwhelming modesty. He said, if I can't do it, my wife can't do it, and our children can't do it, it can't be done. Now, this is a clear statement of the sublime significance of self. But it is comparatively an advanced statement, inasmuch as Dr. Mills included his family. In most cases, the individual alone must either be able to do it or it cannot be done. I guess it was Christian charity that broadened Dr. Mills. Anyway, he did include his near relatives, among those infallible and semi-infallible elements of nature. But the semi-infallible ones were only semi-infallible because they were his. If they'd been anybody else's, they wouldn't have counted. So it all went back finally to this tremendous drive of ego. The individual has no sense within himself of any inadequacy because he would recognize it. How, could in, how can inadequacy tag itself? How can inadequacy recognize inadequacy? Because whatever it is, it is the total, and the total can never appear to be inadequate. The individual cannot conceive of any other self that is smarter, brighter, or better than he is. The only thing he can see is that other people have misunderstood him and suspected that other people were brighter than he was. It is all this peculiarly small, cold, closed world in which we live. Also, we sense this self within ourselves as strangely enduring. It seems to have no beginning and end. It has a semi-independence from the body, but we're not quite sure how that operates. We, can, we know it has some difference from the body because a man can lose both legs and still be himself, so that it cannot be that his self was deposited in his nether limbs. He has to, uh, he has to assume that all of his physical nature, three-quarters of his physical nature, or even a half of a physical nature, is still himself. That there seems to be no diminishment of self. There is also very little indication of diminishment of self in age. Individuals, as they grow older, do not experience the self as growing older. They experience only certain infirmities of the body. The self continues to be timeless in them, and it continues to be their self and alive as long as they are alive, or at least as long as they are conscious of their own existence. So within us is this thing for which we have no adequate definition, 
which is doing basic things with, for which we have no adequate definition, and using energies for which we have no definite or proper and adequate definition. Thus we are founded in a mystery. We are established in a, a secret which we cannot entirely uh, understand. Yet out of this mystery there is continually pouring into manifestation a series of attitudes. These attitudes we grow up with. They seem perfectly natural to us. Even if these attitudes are strangely twisted and corrupted in the views of other people, to us they are ours, and perfectly all right. These attitudes continually flowing out of us not only cause us to like and dislike variously according to our personalities, but they cause us to react variously to the situations and stimuli of life around us. And we develop temperaments, personalities, characters, and dispositions. We have all kinds of moods. We have all kinds of reactions. Uh, even our taste buds are not consistent. One individual likes spinach and another does not. Uh, some individuals like the color blue and some prefer green, and there are not a few that enjoy red better than either. It is the same thing with odors, perfumes, and things of that nature. We have our choices. And in looking at art or great paintings, we are not in agreement as to what is beauty. Listening to music, we are not in agreement as to what is harmony. We assume that all persons upon the same level of attainment would be in harmony. But even this has not always been proved to be true. The only thing we realize and do know is that the more advanced we become in any area of learning, the more patient and tolerant we become. But whether it means a true appreciation or only a sort of resignedness to situations, we are not too certain. But out of this deep, unknown mystery within ourselves, like the auricular vent of Trophonius, comes this something that takes over and tells us that it is ourselves. It tells us that we like this and we do not like that and we can't stand this and we can't tolerate that. And gradually it comes to our conclusion or our attitude that somewhere in the inside of things is a tyrant that is ruling us arbitrarily without making good sense or anything of that nature. Most of the things that we insist upon doing we cannot even justify. The only thing is we know we want to do them. And knowing that we want to do them, we quietly inform ourselves that we intend to do them. And it's just too bad for anybody that gets in our way. But we don't know why. We do not know why one morning we are in good temper and the next morning our disposition is entirely foul. We do not know why. We say we must have eaten something or that uh, uh, perhaps we are running uh, a little acidity or something of that nature, but we don't know why. One writer said that the greatest wars of history have been due to a little too much green bile in the gallbladder. We don't know. But these things strangely seem to emerge from us. Everyone has a different reaction to everything, all due to this mysterious thing within us to ourselves which reacts in a variety of contrary manners, but to which we become entirely accustomed having learned in some patient manner to always get along with ourselves. Here also lies our greater patriotism, for beyond and above all other allegiances is the allegiance to our own desires. Uh, we have to fulfill them. Why? Because we feel like it. Why? Because we do not know. Everything disappears into this not knowing, but out of it comes a despotism which apparently is almost beyond calculation. From this unfinished nature of ourselves, therefore, 
must come this volitional force, the force of the will, which is the continuing pressure of exactly what we are, determining to do exactly what it wills to do. This will does not mean that it arises from any rightness, any certainty, any security, or any value. It simply arises from the immediate compound of the plus and minus factors which have gone together to form a personality. The more aggressive this compound is, uh, the more aggressive the will is going to be. Certain lines of activity have a tendency to be aggressive. The individual who chooses out of the compound of his personality adjustments to be a soldier, uh, a test pilot, an adventurer, choosing hazardous and difficult occupations, certainly has a disposition entirely different from a person who by nature will choose some quiet, peaceful, unobtrusive line of activity. There has to be work for all kinds of people. There are certainly all kinds of people for the work at hand. And out of the diversity of these different activities, the intricate pattern, much of it charming and delightful, some of it terrifying, the intricate pattern of society has been built up. So we have this rather obvious certainty that not only do these faculties which we possess incline us to professions or trades or arts, but these professions in their own turn are only symbolical of the peculiar intensities of our nature. We hear someone say that he is fitted for a certain type of job. That means that his own peculiar pattern of internal processes makes it likely and suitable that he would fit into this particular type of vocation. He is always fitting into an external situation that corresponds with his internal interests. Interests are always the areas of growth and development. Indifferences are always undeveloped areas. Uh, when uh, it became obvious uh, that General Grant did not know at the time he was President of the United States whether the local band was playing Hail to the Chief or Yankee Doodle, it was assumed that the General himself admitted that he had little ear for music. It, uh, it was one of his uh, deficiencies. He had no interest in music, whatever. He didn't know a tune, he couldn't carry one. Now, this indifference does not necessarily mean that the general had outgrown music. It didn't mean a some hold. I met a very uh, impatient man one day, and he was really the impatient spiritual type. Uh, he uh, was one of those persons who, according to his old estimation, was wonderfully poised, but subject to righteous indignation. And I asked him how it was that he was so impatient and at the same time so very highly advanced. And he told me with a perfectly straight face that he had uh, been patient for so long that he had outgrown the need for it. <laughs> now, uh, you can't ask for anything which is a more marvelous picture of the peculiar uh, chemistry of this man's personality. And everyone has these, uh, shall we say, delightful little eccentric areas. But actually, the fact that we are deficient in something does not mean we do not need it. It simply means we've neglected it. And just as an individual uh, with a bad set of teeth, cannot honestly say that he has no need of them. We are always in need of any factor which is inadequate in our own natures. For it is only from a balanced, integrated life that we can arrive at balanced, integrated conclusions on any subject. So the weak spots are not things that we can neglect and forget about and say, oh, well, we really don't need them. We're getting by without them. We're getting by without them, but we're getting by with a limp. 
we're getting by lacking something that we should have to make life richer and more valuable. We are also getting by with blind spots in our own consciousness, which will in time prevent us from recognizing valuable decisions and thereby limiting our success and advancement in almost any field of activity. Out of this imbalanced situation, with some faculties rather strong and others getting by and some not getting by at all, we also uh, engender or generate this power which we call the will. And the will is not simply a single energy. Here I differ from uh, Spinoza and Locke in their definition. I don't think that the human will is just one thing. Actually, when Locke goes into the description of the will, he doesn't either. He cannot but assume that the will is made up of parts. For into the structure of the will must go energies which are in themselves partile, that is, that have an individual or separate nature of their own. Uh, the will, therefore, is again the chemical product of the mingling of another, a number of streams of plus and minus factors. Now, we can speak of wills in various ways. The individual whose will is to us obnoxious, we term merely stubborn. We say this individual never knows when he's wrong, is never willing to acknowledge an error, and uh, is never willing uh, to accept instruction from anyone. Uh, when we sum all this up, we also rather regretfully decide that he is probably the man most likely to succeed because of these various characteristics that he possesses. He will succeed in a way, but he will succeed in a way in which his life will fall to pieces more rapidly than he can put it together. He may uh, achieve that million dollars or the ten million dollars or become president of the great corporation, but he will certainly end with ulcers, and he will certainly have a miserable personal life and will probably reach a state in life that was once reached by John D. Rockefeller Sr., in which he candidly admitted that he would give most of his fortune if he could eat a square meal. Uh, this uh, situation arises from these precious types of human nature, human development. Individuals who simply lose the power to be people and often do not really realize any longer that they have lost that power except they have a gnawing misery in themselves. They're not happy. They're sad, hurt, disappointed, disillusioned people who are friendless and who are lacking in the simple things which make life pleasant and enjoyable. But the will, being conditioned out of this uh, more or less uh, gallimaufry of parts, a sort of a, uh, a stew or soup, as it was called by some of the medieval Arab thinkers, uh, of what we are and what we are not. This will does then become a drive. Now, we, uh, we think of the will as a blind drive. It is not actually a blind drive. It is a very highly calculated drive. The only thing is that we have difficulty in trying to discover who is whipping the horse. Something is forcing this drive. This drive sometimes seems to get entirely out of our own control. We can no longer slow it down ourselves. The thing that is driving, of course, is this ego complex in ourselves, this subjective entity which is uh, pushing and fulfilling its own inordinate pressures. The uh, ego has taken over. And the only thing the ego can do is to, shall we say, try to succeed in this world, because this is the only world in which this ego exists. It cannot plan for a greater and nobler destiny, because it cannot survive into a nobler destiny. That part of man which is destined for better things is much deeper and wiser than the ego. The ego is experienced only in things of this world. 
It is drawing its substances only from the experiences of this world. Its likes and dislikes are based upon reflexes set up from environment. It is completely limited to this particular condition. And because it is so limited and so conditioned, its intensities have to work out on this level, or else these intensities have to be sublimated. Uh, will is a sort of an irresistible force that is constantly coming up against an immovable object. This immovable object is the mass feather bedding of life itself. The will, no matter how tremendous it may be, finally runs out, but the problem never runs out. The individual may will with everything he's got for 80 years, but the objectives will survive him. The individual may build an empire and rule over it, but as surely as he builds it, he will leave it, and the empire will go on and he will not. So the will is, first of all, completely limited by the possibility of human achievement, and many strongly willful people have watched their own physical health crumble with age, watched their sensitivities and sensibilities dim with time, and have seen the empires which they gave everything to create pass to the very hands they did not want to have succeed them. So we have had to watch these kind of experiences also. But the will is blocked and frustrated in every direction. Man is not an unlimited personality dwelling in an eternal time sequence. He cannot build on and on in this world piling empire upon empire, piling one level of achievement upon another. Instead of having such a, an unlimited span in which to force through his own purposes, man will, like Caesar, fall at the foot of the statue of Pompey with his best friend's dagger in his heart, will, like Napoleon, end on St. Helena, or, like Hitler, end in a bunker in Berlin. All of this tremendous willfulness is blocked by the fact that there are always other wills, and that the massings of these other wills can always overwhelm our will. This thought should cause us to relax a little. It should point out that wise people do not attempt the impossible. And even if they should achieve what they consider to be their goal, they have achieved nothing, because the goal will have to pass from them to someone else anyway. If Castro achieves his ends in Cuba, a microbe so small we cannot see it can achieve its ends in Castro. Nothing will go on. The will to do all these things will be ultimately dissipated and drowned in the common sea of will that will go on forever. So in Eastern philosophy, the question simply arises, what are we doing with all this uh, strange and rather purposeless expenditure of vital resources? Is the will worth the price? Actually, is the will the secret of achievement? Do we really get somewhere by knocking our heads against stone walls until something gives off on our heads? Is it actually uh, true that man was created for the purpose of fighting his way to the top with brass knuckles? It seems doubtful. When we observe those who have been willful in the extreme, we see examples we really would not like to emulate. So in the Eastern concepts of philosophy and in Western mysticism and philosophy also, the whole subject of the will has been given a lot of thought. And it has finally been almost universally acknowledged uh, that over-exercising the will is one of man's champion ways of wasting time, that actually nothing can be accomplished uh, by this means. In the Oriental philosophy, something else is substituted for will. 
and in very many instances it works admirably. Because, first of all, uh, will is too toxic in its very activity. It is something that is so heavily conditioned that the individual really never knows when it is supporting him and when it is tearing him down. So instead of will as the secret of getting somewhere, the Eastern mind says there is an effortless effort that is far more productive, far less dangerous, and can uh, bring into activity unsuspected resources of consciousness. In the first place, will obscures facts. Will covers everything with a frightful burst of energy, and the elements and realities of the situation are just neglected. But by this means of effortless effort, the individual changes his policy and a good example of this method of changing is in uh, the selection of, a, of an adequate vocal coach if you intend to take singing lessons. In the, uh, shall we say, robusto style, uh, the principal problem was to open your mouth and bellow. And nearly all, uh, many of the older singers uh, were quite content and happy if they could rattle the chandeliers in the back of the opera house. Then it was gradually discovered that this was the best way to ruin a voice that there was. These voices were damaged, and damaged terribly. Today we know that the best way to learn to vocalize is to reduce effort that the principal problem that every singer has to get rid of is his own throat. If he could lose it, he would sing better. Get his mind off of the noise he is making. Relax and allow the breath to move as it will. And if he controls the breath with a minimum of mental energy, he will produce a pure tone. Well, if he gets behind it and shoves with everything he has, he will develop only a badly pressured, badly trained voice. Same thing in life. The purpose of life, the economy of life, is to use a minimum amount of energy to attain a maximum result. We only have a certain amount of energy. It is not limitless. It is true that some are more richly endowed than others, but energy is a conditioned quantity. And the energy that we waste is gone. And most of the energy we use, use energizing will, is wasted. Let's take another example of this problem. Let us say that a person wishes to achieve a certain end. To achieve this certain end does not require any vast push. The only reason why the individual seemingly has to over push in order to achieve is because he is trying to push through his own static. There is a situation in himself, a failure of his own nature to respond, that he has to practically force his, his way through his own inertia and indifference. If, however, the full nature of the personality is in agreement on something, if the purposes necessary, proper, and desirable are clearly understood, then the achievement is one of the simplest, most direct, an effortless way of achieving that end. This requires no will whatever, requiring something quite different from will, nothing aggressive, but a constantly increasing understanding of that which is necessary. The individual who knows what is necessary 
and has a normal nature will do that which he knows to be necessary without fanfare, excitement, or pressure. All through life, therefore, there is this struggle against this type of will which is forever thrusting out and interfering with the free circulation of human energies. And this quiet, controlled method by means of which the person moves continuously, effortlessly toward those goals which are right and proper for him. He is non-competitive. He does not need to compete because he knows within himself that the one true method of achieving is to attain the degree of insight which is necessary to control the condition. Willpower is almost always associated with a measure of bluff. The individual is forcing a situation which he does not actually understand or control. Thus, in the uh, philosophical system, the purpose has always been to re reduce the intensity of will action. Reduce this sense of continual emergency under which we live. Get over this idea that we must be doing something, even if it is not important. Get over this concept that if we appear to be driving with everything we have, we must be going somewhere. Because the only place we can be sure to get by that means is an early grave. It is the importance of the quiet, coordinated uh, continu continuity of enlightened purpose. This is what actually wins and, res and conserves almost all of our natural energy and resource. We can proceed on a minimum of en energy expenditure and achieve a maximum of constructive result. So as we begin to relax this power of the will, we begin to have to try to find out how we can change the chemistry in our own personality by means of which this will is forever popping up. Uh, the fact that we are willful seems to confront us with a problem. We can't just say to an individual, don't be willful. We might as well say to him, don't worry. He's going to keep right on worrying because it's his nature to worry. Therefore, the only way you can change the human being is to sneak up on him in some insidious manner and alter the syndrome. You can't touch him head on. You can't tell him to change. But you can do what Confucius did. And Confucius was a very wise man in these matters. He said to his disciples, when you see the great prince who is very arrogant, very proud, very self-secure, don't go up to this man and tell him that he's wrong. Don't tell him that he's a fool, because he will probably reward you by having your head chopped off. And uh, you will be the fool for having taken such an attitude. Do not attempt head-on collision with willful people. Do not attempt a head-on collision with your own will because it's going to be a losing fight. How are you going to brace yourself against yourself? Where are you going to put this fulcrum with which you expect to turn over your own disposition? You have no place. The only thing you can fight will with is itself. And this is a kind of shadow boxing that seldom gets anywhere. So Confucius said, uh, you, can, you can do this thing, but you must do it in an entirely different way. Wherever there is tremendous will intensity, there is also a, an area of intense guardianship. The individual 
who has his mind set on something, who is determined to accomplish something, and who is extremely willful, is ever upon the defensive against anyone who is apt to interfere with him. And he is also on the defensive against interfering with himself, for he would consider any mitigation of his own intensity by himself as only a symbol of weakness. He, you, he is going to be very hard to work with. So Confucius said, when you see the great willful prince who is going to do exactly as he pleases, don't tell him about it at all. Teach him music. Leave, what, leave his will the way it is. But add something somewhere to the pattern of his consciousness. And immediately the total syndrome will change. It has to. The individual who changes any part of his nature changes all of it. Don't go after his vital uh, defense areas. Take on some other phase of his nature. If he is quarrelsome, teach him to paint. If he is an individual who has tremendous mental and emotional intensities, Teach him the tea ceremony, as they do in Japan. Take him out and let him become aware of another kind of world. Gradually induce him in some way to make some change of some kind in himself. Perhaps he can be induced to take up a hobby. Perhaps he can be uh, convinced that some Philanthropy or charity needs his managing ability. Perhaps he can be flattered or in some way or other uh, impressed with the need for travel. Don't touch the vulnerable area in yourself or anyone else because you will bring against yourself the whole total pressure of your own will. You have to get behind the will. Realizing that as you become civilized, the will will become less intensive. Thus, the total integration of your personality is the only way to ultimately subjugate the will. The will will not press unless you have pressure. And people who are happy, adjusted, busy, well concerned with things that interest them, enjoying a diversity of life experience, having fun with their children, appreciating nice things, these people are not under this intense pressure which can only be satisfied by an aggravated form of ambition. So whatever it may be, do not touch the delicate spot. Because instantly, like the sea of enemy, the will will close around and, and force uh, the continuance of its own state. Rather, see how you can build into your own nature uh, some other quality or attribute. Now, in the areas where this is most necessary, it is least seldom uh, found. People who are interested in philosophy uh, feel that life just has to be one great big philosophic tussle. They've got to uh, think of nothing that is not deadly serious. Uh, they have got to do they have nothing on their mind but the vast need of humanity for enlightenment. And they have to continue to feel that they are the frustrated uh, persons who might have been able to do great things if anybody had been willing to listen to them. It gets more and more tiresome. It gets more and more difficult. And there is no break in this strange determination of the nature to try to force good counsel on someone who doesn't want it. This is one of the great sources of human disappointment. The same in religion. Everyone takes religion so desperately seriously that they feel that more or less they are born to suffer. And therefore, if they develop in religious intensities of one kind of another, which alienate them from other people and make them difficult to live with even for themselves, 
that there is some strange virtue in this, that they're really now beginning to suffer for the glory of God. This is not the type of mind that is going to solve anything. The true type of solution is the individual who is able to free himself from this tremendous sense of urgency, realizing that it is far more important to do things well than it is to do them quickly. So if uh, possible, begin to balance into yourself elements by which you broaden and deepen appreciation of fineness, enlarge your interest in various areas which are now neglected, and if you are in some strongly professional pursuit that is humdrum and routine, try to make your avocational life, the, the parts of your day that are not dedicated to these necessary labors, make them as colorful and interesting and dynamic as possible. The individual who works all day and then goes home and sulks all evening is simply destroying himself. He must break away from this pressure of urgencies, or else he will ultimately be replaced by another man. Industry Day is wearing out men in five and ten years. The individual, under the pressures of the moment, is unable to meet this tremendous drive of industry. He wears himself out. And yet a Taoist monk could meet that drive for 50 years and be undamaged. He would get the work done, too. But there'd be no tension in himself, no stress, no strain, no fear. And because he was quietly, continuously fulfilling certain routine duties, the larger part of his mind would be free for his own thinking. He would never obstruct or obscure the whole mind with worries and anxieties over a small, particular fragment of his intellect. So if the individual can gradually uh, enlarge interests in a, in a reasonable and sensible manner, he will find that he can gain a great deal of vitality and energy from uh, this type of procedure. The, uh, the, uh, the opposite of this driving will is, is gracious adjustment. The individual who can adjust can survive. And a certain quiet gracious gives us the remedy against this constant pressure of our own desire. Though in Buddhism, of course, the emphasis is to get rid of the desire itself, to enter finally into a state of desirelessness, <clears throat> until there is only really one desire left, and that is the desire to serve others. This desire perhaps is not as dangerous as some, but uh, even this in Zen must ultimately be rejected. But in the common way of things, uh, the reduction, the gradual, systematic reduction of desire has no effect upon efficiency. In fact, if anything, it improves it. Because the individual who is tense always takes longer to do anything. The nervous, pressureful, uncertain, fearing person is all thumbs. His work will be loaded with mistakes, and in his desperate effort to be always right, he will be frequently wrong. If this same person reduces these pressures within himself, he will achieve much more. I know one example, a person came uh, to me who was really in a bit of a dither about the whole problem. He had that kind of an ego within himself that simply couldn't bear being wrong. Of course, he was wrong all the time, but he didn't find it out. But whenever it seemed that he was about to discover it, every resource of his nature tried to conceal the fact from himself. 
It was not that he was really so tremendously, sincerely dedicated to his profession. It was nothing but ego. He could not stand being wrong. And because he was always afraid that he would make mistakes, he made them by the dozen. Every moment, trying to protect his own infallibility, he made errors that were humiliating and very nearly cost him employment. If this man was able to simply stop the ego factor, he was well equipped to do his work. It wasn't that he did not know how. He was simply psychologically muscle-bound. Whenever a problem arose, tension came with it. Tension and fear. And his fear was simply the fear of humiliation. It never occurred to him that he would make mistakes and should be the first to admit that he made mistakes. After considerable working with this chap, I was finally able to get him to the point where he can see that it was possible that he could, on rare occasions, make a mistake. This uh, was the understatement of the generation, but at the same time, he finally got that far. And almost immediately, even this little uh, break in his armament began to produce better results. And when he saw this, he did go on a little further. And after a while, he came to me and he said, I've made a single, a sing, a single victory. I've just made a mistake and laughed at myself. I've just said to myself, you see now just what a fool you can be. And he says, I think I'm cured. And his rate of error went down immediately. As soon as he admitted it, as soon as he was willing simply to face it, he relaxed. And the tension which made the mistakes was removed. Willfulness does this time and time again. Willfulness creates its own obstacles. Willfulness forces the individual into an eternal defensive. He must constantly protect himself against something. And this exhausts him and opens him to countless errors because he no longer had the energy with which to organize his own thinking. He was confused by the pressure and the fight going on within himself. If we as students of philosophy are really trying to get something beneficial out of religion or psychology, as our interests may lie, there's nothing that would be more useful to us than the realization that there is no real ratio between will and result. That it is not that the will signifies the strength of the person. The will is not the thing by which achievement is attained or made inevitable. That which is the real uh, source or mainspring of progress for ourselves, within ourselves, is this thing that psychology terms insight. It is becoming aware of where the values are. It is becoming aware of that which is next for us. And it is gradually developing the quiet resource to do that which is next, without fanfare and without tremendous dynamic. The individual does not need this will factor in the majority of instances. In rare cases, nature has provided the will to give us emergency strength or emergency force in the presence of obstacles. It has given us, as, almost as it has given us courage, as a way of meeting uh, a disaster or meeting an emergency. Will can get us across with a special burst of steam across some critical situation that arises. 
But will as a steady diet is a deadly loss. It is not a substitute for attainment in anything. Actually, will uh, is in conflict and sets up conflict between man and the universe in which he lives. Self-will against universal will is a bad pattern. What we term progress today is this deadly struggle of man's eternal determination uh, coming into conflict with natural law. Now, man may win to a degree, and he begins to think now a little more optimistically about conquering space and hopes that by means of the Einsteinian formula he will discover that he can outwit time and live long enough to get to another planet, star, or sun and come back. These things are fascinating theories, and they are very intriguing. But the actual problem that man faces is not this at all. Here he is, heading out into space. And as one observer noted, with no certainty there will be any Earth here when he gets back. The problem isn't whether he can get somewhere else. The question is, what will be happening here while he's gone? And this he doesn't get around to at all. It hasn't occurred to him that it would be very important for him to brighten the corner where he is now and get certain things done that desperately need doing. But with his eyes to the stars, like Thales of old, he is not watching his feet and is about to fall into another ditch. This business of always overleaping the immediate is a habit of man, but it's a poor habit. It never pays off very well. Actually, our real problem is not this tremendous struggle to overwhelm the master space. If necessary, trying to violate its laws in order to get there. Our problem is to learn how these laws operate and move with them in every way possible. Another very simple example of this entire situation is the modern practice of therapy. Today, we are actually attempting, by means of various drugs, to impose man's remedies upon a universal pattern. We have decided that we are going to create health. The man is going to be healthy if we kill him getting him that way. We are going to use one wonder drug on him after another until the internal, internal part of his nature resembles an experimenting field at Almagado. We are going to set off one bomb inside of him after another. We are going to prove conclusively that the individual can make all the mistakes known in history and still feel good that he can do as he pleases, and that we will outwit laws of cause and effect with a compound in which the small pellets dissolve slowly, giving us relief for several hours. We are going to do it our way, and we probably will live to see a great many people drop dead as a result of this. And we will be fortunate if we do not live to see ourselves drop dead. Let us face it because we are going to do it our way. The way to health is not this way at all. Uh, the way to success is not over the bodies and minds and hearts of other people. The way to all things that are worthwhile in nature are, is a quiet way of, accept, of acceptance and obedience. We don't need these things. We don't need these fantastic cures. They are for people who have willed themselves into a state of sickness by insisting on living contrary to the laws of nature. They are mostly persons who have allowed their own will power to lead them from one absurdity of conduct to another. They have forced their own determination upon other people have wrecked others' lives and then their own. 
And then in the midst of every neurotic situation you can think of, they are now determined to cure themselves with wonder drugs. And we are foolish enough, a great many people are foolish enough to think they can do it. Actually, the same is true of our minds, our natures, and our happiness. The beginning of success of a truly successful person is to be established firmly in those natural patterns which are suitable and proper to man. Without this establishment, he'll get nowhere and cannot survive. Then to discover what is proper for man to do. Now, it may well be that it's going to be proper for him to conquer space. We don't know this. But we don't know that it is. But we know that between his present state and the conquest of space is a vast area of self-conquest which he has never undertaken. So before we go out trying to change the face of the universe, it might be better to make sure that our own natures are adequate to our needs. We, there is no use in extending our domain into space and doing to other planets what we are doing to other nations right here on this earth. Wherever we go, wherever civilization moves in, trouble comes with it. This is not what was intended, and this is not what should be. But it will be this way as long as everybody moves by impulse and nobody by common sense. Our common sense has the best chance to function when we are not kicking ourselves around or bossing other people to death. If we can relax and be fairly quiet and subdue these intensities by simply not stimulating them, we can perhaps get some re thoughtful, reflective relationship with ourselves. If the average person uh, could sit down quietly and experience communion with his own inner nature for one half hour, it might change the course of his life. It certainly would help considerably. But driving on, always objectively, always on the outside, always neglecting the inside, the person simply has no reference frame, no security in time of trouble, and nowhere to go except uh, in this strange, mad race to his own extinction. Buddha was of the simple opinion that you sometimes have to help nature in these kind of problems. So he created a, a set of obligations or rules which he imposed upon his monks and arhats. These rules were almost identical in every detail of the monastic rules of Europe. There was very, very little difference. But they were based on the simple process. If you want to find out what truth is, if you want to experience internal liberation from your own negative dispositional pressures, then you have to gradually uh, remove the temptations from your life which make you a victim of selfishness. Therefore, Buddha pointed out the importance of the individual gradually relaxing away from the sense of possession. Not that he was to be beggared, not that he was to give up everything, but that he was no longer to think of things as belonging to him. Rather to regard everything that exists in this world as belonging to itself, and that the best that we can possibly attain at any given time in our lives is a certain guardianship over natural things that were here before we came and will be here after we go. We can never own them. The only thing we can do is have a short lease on them. And our most important problem is to see that when we give them back, to this stream of life to which they will always belong, that we give them back in as good condition as we got them in the first place, that we did not receive something beautiful 
and put it back broken and defaced. We cannot possess. All we can do is use. By what right do we then have temporary proprietorship? There is only one right recognized in nature, and that is the right of use. That individual is entitled to use that which he can use wisely. He is entitled to have at his disposal such resources as he can intelligently apply to the improvement of himself and others. Other resources do not belong to him. Anything that he wastes, anything that he squanders, anything that he uses for destructive purposes, he has no right of guardianship or even temporary possession. He proves his right to have by his ability to use. The individual has, therefore, in this world, nothing that he can call his own. He has nothing in this world that he can do that will actually solve the problem of his own existence. Whether he is a success or a failure, man is born, man suffers, and man dies. If we could break this tremendous exertion of will to achieve things which cannot be achieved and are not valuable after they are attained, are attained and get out of this desperate determination to conquer a world which must ultimately conquer us and swallow us into it again, we can relax. When we can relax, we can be good friends. We can be good parents. We can have beauty, music, art, literature. We can love poetry. We can take those walks along the side of the mountain. We can backpack into the hills if we want to. We can earn decent livings and good livings. But we can earn them quietly with a full realization that by this labor we are paying our own way in life. But that we are not here to gobble up. We are not here to dominate markets. We are not here to build corporation on corporation until the whole thing falls apart of its own weight. We are here to work together to build a world such as we would like to leave to our own children, a world of peace and quietude and brotherhood. We will not do this with mad expressions of willpower. Even if these willpower expressions are a, an over-resolute determination to have peace, even if we have to fight for it. This is the whole problem. We do not achieve peace by overwhelming or combating or fencing with the wills of other people. We, ha we achieve peace by quietly accomplishing those labors which we know to be best in our own small world, in the circle where we live. And we gain not only peace, but we gain better health, better enjoyment, freedom from the tremendous temptations which lead individuals into one dilemma after another, and such dilemmas as are now arising are enough to frighten the angels. We do not need these things. They are all sick, half-crazy people fighting desperately for something like state, status, struggling for a little of this more, a little of that more ever willing to sacrifice life, character, integrity, value for this gratification of this determination to have what they want. Let's just relax the whole thing and realize that we do not know what we need. As Pythagoras is reported to have said, all men know what they want, but only the gods know what they need. If we are quiet and reasonable, perhaps the divine part of ourselves will tell us what we need. But sometime we must realize that there is a great difference between fulfilling a need and gratifying a desire. Fulfilling a need helps us to grow and be bigger people. 
the eternal gratification of desire is destroying us and tearing down our civilization. So we have to realize the need for the quietude, the peace, and the serenity of the untroubled life, the life that is free from unreasonable ambition, free from blind pressure of will, and free from man's constant and eternal determination to outwit his fellow man. We don't need these things. Without them, we're getting somewhere. With them, we're getting nowhere. So relax the will, take it easy, and uh, just kind of float along on the surface of events, and you, we hope they will float you back here next Wednesday evening. Thank you very much.